Of course, it's a very big question of how will the universe end? And one way to examine that question is to examine the stability of the universe. And by st stability of the universe, I mean stability of the quantum vacuum. And so that's where we need to start this exploration is what the heck is the quantum vacuum and how can it be stable or, or not? depending on various things that we're about to get into. Now, number one, the quantum vacuum itself. Uh, you have to realize, you have to remember that the primary object in physics is not the particle. Mm -mm 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 -mm. It's not the particle, it's the field. In modern physics, the primary physical entity, the thing that makes all the things is the field. These fields soak all of space and time like, uh, like olive oil and vinegar in a piece of bread. They, they're just everywhere. And pieces of these fields can excite and vibrate and become particles or what we recognize as particles. And so every kind of particle has a field associated with it, like the photon has the electromagnetic field. The electron has an electron field. The top quark has a top quark field and so on and so on and so on. And it's all these fields, these quantum fields that permeate all of space time that constantly wiggle back and forth, communicate, interfere, uh, do all sorts of complicated stuff that add up to what we call physics. So what we are interested in investigating is whether the quantum fields that make up our reality are stable. That this particular configuration of fields, that this particular arrangement of fields is going to hang out forever. Now, as far as we can tell, it's pretty darn stable because our universe is 13.77 billion years old, which is not a short amount of time. And as all of our observations suggest that the quantum fields that we have today, the arrangement of forces, the arrangement of particles, the families of particles have been the same for that entire 13.7 billion year history. So the four forces of nature have been the four forces of nature for billions of years. The electrons have been electrons for billions of years. The top quarks and the neutrinos have been top quarks and neutrinos for billions of years. Nothing has changed, but things were different. Things were different in the very earliest moments of the universe. The four forces of nature have not always been the four forces of nature. There was a time in our past when our universe did not have four forces of nature. I know that's super crazy to think about, but it's real and we have direct evidence for it because we can recreate some of these conditions in our most powerful particle accelerators, which is exactly why we built the part of powerful particle accelerators. That's why we did it. Check this out, it's super high energies. The electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force merge together to become a single unified force that we call the electroweak force. And in that universe, in the earliest moments of the universe when it was like less than a second old, and in that pocket of the universe in a particle accelerator, there are only three forces of nature. There's gravity, there's strong nuclear, and there's electroweak three forces of nature. And that electroweak force has a totally different character, totally different force carriers, totally different structure than the electromagnetic and the weak nuclear forces. So if you were to go back in time to when our universe was less than a second old, you would instantly die because it would be horrible. But if somehow you could survive, you would be in a different universe. You would be in a different quantum state. The, the vacuum, the quantum fields of the universe would be in a different arrangement. And this arrangement had only three forces of nature, gravity, strong nuclear, and electroweak. 
If you go back even further, then the strong nuclear force merges on to the electroweak to, to give something we call the grand unified theory, which we don't fully understand at all, or not even a little bit. And then if you go back even further, presumably there is a single unified force, but we have no idea what's going on there. So we don't need to talk about that. What we're concerned about is the last splitting of the forces. That as our universe expanded and cooled, that arrangement of forces that was happening in the, in the earliest moments was not stable. It was an unstable configuration. And it split apart. It broke apart. The electroweak force split into the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force. With the electromagnetic force came the photon, which has infinite range and talks to electric charges. And then with the weak nuclear force came the W and Z bosons, which are massive and have short range and mediate the weak interaction. They look totally different, totally different. The universe after that split looked radically different than, uni than the universe before that split. That is what we call a phase transition. It was rapid, it was fast, and it encompassed the entire universe and it was radical. So that phase transition, the electroweak splitting, the transition from a unified electroweak force to a split force happened and led to a more stable configuration. And so the question we have now, and that is the configuration that has persisted for billions of years, and the question we have now is will that configuration persist for eternity? To answer that question, we need to know of all things, to all of all things, to guess at the stability of our universe, we need to know the mass of the Higgs boson. Who would have guessed that it would come down to that one number, the mass of the Higgs boson, to determine if our universe is going to radically transform or not? But the reason, the reason that the Higgs boson is so important is that electroweak splitting, when the electroweak force split into the electromagnetic and the weak nuclear force, the thing that did the splitting was the Higgs boson. It was the presence of the Higgs boson that drove the wedge into those forces, kept them apart, and made that splitting happen. In fact, that was the original motivation for the Higgs mechanism and the Peter Higgs and all his work. And then also it turned out to explain particle mass, but that was like a separate thing. That was a bonus. The original thing was to explain this electroweak unification or the breaking of the electroweak unification. So we need, the Higgs is playing a role. It played a role in that splitting, in that phase transition billions of years ago. And we want to know if the Higgs is going to hang around for a while. Is it here to stay or is it just uh, temporary? And in order to determine that, we need to know its mass. Because the more massive a particle or a field or a whatever is in particle physics, the less stable it is. It's more likely to decay into something more lower mass, more stable. So if the Higgs has a mass above a certain threshold, it's likely to decay. And once the Higgs goes away, it's game, it's game on. There's going to be new rules of the universe that we're going to undergo a phase transition because the Higgs is doing the work of maintaining our current vacuum stability. And if the Higgs goes away, it, it, it goes away and then we have a new universe. But if the, if the Higgs is low enough mass, then it will hang around for a very long time and it's likely to be in its most stable configuration. But in order to get the mass of the Higgs, we also need to get the mass of the top quark. It sounds like I'm making things up, but all this is real. And that's because in particle physics, your mass is never just your mass. It's always the combination of interactions that you're always having with other things. So the Higgs mass is in part determined by its interaction with the top quark. Why the top quark? Because it's the most massive quark. So it has the biggest contribution. It's, it's, the, it's the biggest thing in the room. And that's what's going to determine the 
in a very roundabout, complicated particle physics-y way, the mass of the Higgs. So if you can pin down the top quark mass and you can pin down the Higgs mass, you can determine if our universe is going to be stable. So we did it. We measured the mass of the Higgs boson. We measured the mass of the top quark as best we could. And our universe, good news and bad news. The good news is our universe is not unstable. Otherwise, you know, it, it would have phased transitioned billions of years ago. Bad news is that our universe is also not stable. The measured mass of the Higgs is right on that line, right on the border between stable and unstable. It's something we call metastable. It's a situation where it's stable for now, but if something goes wrong, then the whole universe collapses and transforms. But that's the measurement that we have. That's the observation that we have. What does this mean? It means that if we're right, and we don't know if we're right because this is, this is pretty theoretical high energy physics stuff. We do not have a complete description of all the forces of nature at these energies. So we don't know if we can 100% trust these calculations, but it's what, what we got so far. And so we're going to run with it. What this tells us is that our universe is currently in what we call a metastable state. It means that any point somewhere around in this vast cosmos, you know, maybe over there, you know, right, maybe right here, you never know, there can be a random quantum fluctuation because that's what quantum fields do. They randomly fluctuate and they just find a more stable configuration of the underlying quantum fields. You know, it's like, it's like if something's like bothering you, you've got an itch or an ache, you don't really pay attention to it, you don't really pay attention. And then you finally scratch it, oh, oh, that's what was bothering me. Now you feel a lot more comfortable. That's gonna, what is, what gonna, is going to happen to the universe at some point. It might happen tomorrow. It might happen a trillion years from now. It might have already happened. In one little pocket of the universe, all it takes is one quantum fluctuation. It finds its two, true ground state where the Higgs has decayed into something else and there's a completely new arrangement. If that fluctuation is big enough, then it will start to expand and it will start to expand very rapidly reaching nearly the speed of light and initiate the process of the phase transition of the universe. Where outside the bubble, it's just our universe with stars and planets and trees and cheese and whatnot. And then inside the bubble is something else. And that wave front propagates outward at nearly the speed of light. So you can't really see it coming and it just washes over you. It just blink and it's gone and you're in the new universe. This could have already started in some pocket of the universe and we won't find out about it until it, it reaches us. So we don't know. It might never happen because the right quantum juju that makes that fluctuation and finding the true ground state happen just never occurs. But it might have already happened. I'm sorry. What would that new universe look like? Well, we don't know because it's literally a new universe. But we, but we can speculate about what would happen if the Higgs were to go away and the quantum fields of our universe were to find a true ground state, their most stable configuration. Not this pretend stability that they've had for 13 billion years, but the real deal that will continue for eons. Well, it could be absolutely nothing. The Higgs could decay into something that's just slightly less massive and then basically all of physics is the same. It could be something mild and something that no one really cares about. Like it might change neutrino mass. Who cares if a neutrino mass changes? Uh, it might do something with dark energy. You know, dark energy is its own quantum field, presumably. It might change its evolution maybe inside that new universe. It could also be a completely brand new set of physics. 
The transformation can be so radical that there is uh, new forces of nature, new particles, where it's just 100% new, where, where life and chemistry and nuclear reactions as we know it are completely impossible because inside that bubble, the universe is playing by a different set of rules. It's like basketball on the outside and, and hockey on the inside. It's just a different game, a different set of rules. In which case, if that were to be the case, and the wavefront were to pass over us right now, you, of course, would be instantly obliterated. So sleep tight. I'll see you next time for more Ask a Spaceman. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to keep these videos going. I really do appreciate it.